Okay, let's get into biological basis of behavior. This is about really the biological perspective. Why you are the way you are based on your body and physiology. The textbook does talk about the interaction of heredity and environment, and there's something called the nature-nurture controversy that's gonna persist throughout the course. How much of you are you because of genetics? How much of you are you because of your environment, right? Are you born this way? Are you made this way? That's the nature-nurture controversy, and we're gonna be hearing a lot about that. You have to know basically the difference between what is nature, like you're born this way, versus nurture, you're made this way. So in the twin and adoption studies, it's gonna favor the side of nature that you are born this way. And you're gonna talk about identical twins versus fraternal twins. Remember, identical twins, same egg, fraternal twins, different eggs. And then they're gonna talk about epigenetics, how like your genes can change because of your environment. And that's really interesting stuff. We posted, and I have posted, some interesting videos that explain this. Speaking of the nature-nurture controversy, your textbook even talks about Beyonce and Jay-Z. Is the fact that they are raising their daughter in a very creative environment full of nurturing her talent, is that gonna play a role in her becoming an artist or is it just genetics that she came from two very talented people? Okay, so you have a nervous system. You have the central nervous system versus the peripheral nervous system. Remember that the central nervous system is your brain and your spinal cord, end of story. It's the center of everything. The peripheral nervous system is everything outside of that. In the peripheral nervous system, you have the somatic nervous system, which is like muscle movements that you can control. So think of soma means body. You control your body, this is voluntary movements. The other nervous system is the autonomic or the autonomic nervous system. Think of autopilot, like it works all by itself. Now the autonomic nervous system or autonomic nervous system has two aspects also. It has the sympathetic versus the parasympathetic. I want you to think of this. Have sympathy for me. My house is on fire, someone's trying to kill me. That's the sympathetic nervous system or fight or flight. That's your emergency mode when you perceive danger. But when you don't perceive danger and everything's okay, your body goes on kind of like energy saving mode. We call that the parasympathetic nervous system. Think of the paramedics are here. Rest and digest. Paramedic, right? Parasympathetic. Think of that as a good mnemonic device to help you differentiate between sympathetic versus parasympathetic of the autonomic nervous system. So this was a slide to remind us the difference between parasympathetic and sympathetic. What happens to your body when it's in fight or flight versus emergency or energy saving mode. And in fight or flight, your pupils are gonna dilate. Blood is gonna be allocated to the muscles so that you can run faster and you can fight harder and you can lift heavy things. Remember that digestion during fight or flight just simply stops. All unnecessary things that are not gonna help save your life at the moment, pretty much dies down for the moment until you're in parasympathetic mode where it picks back up again. Okay, you are in charge of knowing the parts of the neuron, right, their structures and their functions. So you should know that there are two kinds of neuron, afferent and efferent neurons, also known as sensory and motor neurons. And then there's the neurons in between called interneurons. Remember that sensory neurons take in information, correct? And so we're gonna call those afferent neurons that begins the letter A. They take in information from the environment, while motor neurons are going to act on that. We're gonna also call those efferent neurons with an E. They exit, right? So they're gonna go from central nervous system to out, and then you're going to move your arm voluntarily or kick your leg voluntarily. So remember, you have to know three different kinds of neurons, afferent, efferent, and interneurons. Just know it. And also, know the two ways that neurons talk. They talk electrically, and they talk with uh, well, electrical impulses, and they talk chemically with these chemical messengers called neurotransmitters. You gotta know those too. 
so you've gone to the doctors and they might have tapped on your knee to see if you have that knee jerk response, which is pretty normal, right? Well, here they're just talking about how sensory neurons take in that little tap that you feel on the knee and that motor neurons actually react to that response. And the same thing is true when you put your hand on a hot stove, or in this case, a hot candle, right? Sensory neurons take in that information and motor neurons move your hand so you don't get burned. So like I was saying before, you need to know the structure and functions of the parts of the neuron. And I'm gonna teach you a neuron dance, which I probably already taught you. Dendrite, cell body, axon terminal, myelin sheath, nodes of Ranvier. Does that sound familiar? That's your dance, yes. And you also have to know the all or none principle, which basically says when a neuron fires, it's gonna fire as hard as it can, and if it doesn't, it will die. And remember also the reuptake mechanism. It's, I'm making this more simplistic than it actually is, but remember, Two neurons are talking, let me get my hands in the screen, right? Two neurons are talking to each other. One neuron's gonna let out that neurotransmitter, and that neurotransmitter is gonna be floating here in this synapse. Well, an SSRI blocks the reuptake. The word here is reuptake. Once that neurotransmitter is released, this guy who let it go, he's gonna take that back if this one doesn't take it. So if this guy over here is a little too slow to take that neurotransmitter, this guy's gonna take it back. What SSRIs are trying to do is block that reuptake mechanism so that your cells can absorb more of that mood elevating serotonin. That's what SSRIs are about. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, they are gonna block the reuptake, that take back mechanism of the serotonin, allowing one to feel better and a relief with their depression. It's going to elevate their mood. So the action potential is going to be that electrical charge that's needed for the neuron to function. Now threshold is that minimum amount of stimulus energy needed for it to actually do something. And we're going to get more in depth in thresholds and absolute threshold in another chapter. Now refractory is that recharging period, that refractory period. Now don't get confused with synapse. Synapse is just a space or a junction. It's the space between those two neurons. We're going to call that the synaptic gap or the synapse where synapse takes place. And remember that neurotransmitters, there's going to be a handful that you have to know very, very well. That's the chemical messenger. So remember I talked about the neuron talking in two distinct ways, an electrical, like a stimulus, a charge, or through a chemical transmission or a chemical messenger. If you need more help understanding the neuron and how it works and the different things the AP exam is requiring you to know, look at these supplemental videos. They really, really help. Okay, do you see these eight neurotransmitters right over here? Yeah, you have to know them and know them well. So think of ACH, think of A for ACH, A for Alzheimer's, an undersupply of ACH or acetylcholine can lead to Alzheimer's. Think of dopamine. Dopamine is gonna be involved with like learning and attention. So if there's too much dopamine, this is important, schizophrenia, too little dopamine, this is important. Think of Parkinson's disease, tremors, Serotonin, a really popular neurotransmitter they ask about. Serotonin, think of that as your mood elevator. Too little of serotonin can lead to things like depression. And we're going to, we just talked about SSRIs. Norepinephrine, think of that as something like your energy, right? Think of norepinephrine as like your adrenaline. It's going to help control alertness and arousal. So if you don't have enough of that, that can lead you as like being down, like not enough of energy and that's what happens when people are depressed you don't have that umph that get up and go um GABA 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 amino butyric acid GABA an undersupply of GABA could actually lead to things like seizures um tremors insomnia it's also been related to like migraine headaches
headaches. Glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter. It's going to make that heart beat. And remember that an oversupply could also lead to things like seizures. Endorphins, think of mighty morphine endorphins. Endorphins are kind of like your painkiller. It's your body's natural morphine. And substance P, it's really influential in pain perception and also the immune response. Know your neurotransmitters, especially these eight. Know the difference between an agonist and an antagonist. Remember that agonists are going to be like things that perpetrate something to happen, a molecule that increases the action of a neurotransmitter. But an antagonist is the opposite. An antagonist is going to be a molecule that inhibits or blocks a neurotransmitter's action. Don't get them mixed up. Okay, big difference between the nervous system and the endocrine system. One is very fast and one is very, very slow. Think of the neurotransmissions when they pass from one neuron to the next as super fast, lightning fast, as opposed to the endocrine system being very slow. When you think of the endocrine system, think of hormones. Think of puberty, how that happens very, very slow. You don't just wake up one day with a full beard and like, hello, mom, I like breakfast. No, like it happens very, very slowly right so think of puberty as evolving slowly so does the endocrine system act slowly upon the body know these endocrine glands interior pituitary secretes growth hormone so too little that can lead to dwarfism too much gigantism posterior pituitary raises your blood pressure constricts the blood vessels secretes oxytocin in women it's going to spark labor the thyroid is going to increase metabolism growth and maturation the parathyroid is going to increase blood calcium levels and decrease potassium the pancreas is going to secrete your insulin regulate those sugar levels and and then hormones are going to be chemical messengers that travel throughout the body that make change happen. In this part of the textbook, they do relate neurotransmission and neuron action and firing, and they link it to substance abuse disorders and psychoactive drugs. Probably the most important part of this chapter is knowing your drug categories. So know that alcohol, for example, is a depressant. Know that barbiturates are things like tranquilizers, also a depressant. Um, opioids could also be depressants, um, but they can also act on the body as a hallucinogen. Um, stimulants are going to stimulate, like make you go fast. Like, for example, nicotine is considered a stimulant. So know your drug categories, and you should kind of be able to identify which drug fits under which category. So here you should know that cocaine is a stimulant, methamphetamines is also a stimulant, ecstasy is a stimulant and a hallucinogen, and hallucinogen, some examples would be LSD and marijuana. Well, the word plasticity or elasticity is your brain's ability to kind of refurbish itself. So in this module in 1.4, they talk about neuroplasticity and the tools of discovery, like how we see and how we experience neuroplasticity. Um, when they talk about the biological psychologist, it's talking about like the, your physiology, how people study who you are and how you behave based on your physiology, your biological makeup. Levels of analysis is the differing complementary Complementary views from biological, psychological, and sociocultural like angles, different perspectives while analyzing any given phenomenon. And so this is going to be discussed throughout the text. See this great little chart that I made you, including little pictures? Know this chart. It's not decoration. This is really informative. So know the difference between all these different neural measures. EEG, MEG, the CT scan, the PET, the MRI, and the fMRI. Know them. Know how they work. Um, give some sample findings. And if you look at the image, it kind of helps you remember. It's like putting a name to a face, right? Look at the image and know these different techniques. 
Okay, when you're looking at these brain images, remember that when you see red and orange, that's a lot of activity. It's like hot, right? Like lots of activity is happening. And when you see the cooler colors, like the purple and the blue and the darkness, right? That's inactivity. So look at the difference between one brain and another. Look at the Alzheimer's patient, right? The normal brain versus early Alzheimer's and then late Alzheimer's. Absolutely stunning, right? How little the brain is actually Actually firing up where it should be if you compare it to the typical brain so when you look at your brain scans remember that the darker colors like the you know like the darkness or the blue or the purple that's going to be inactivity red orange yellow lots of activity In this part of the module, you have to know your brain structures and functions. For example, the forebrain, the cerebral cortex, the thalamus, and the hypothalamus, and the hindbrain, the pons, medulla, cerebellum. And yes, you have to know which each individual structure is and what it does. The medulla, think of the medulla as the brain structure that's going to keep you alive. It's in charge of getting that heart to beat. It's in charge of breathing and your blood pressure. You don't want to mess with the medulla. It's very important that you keep it safe. And here's the story of Phineas Gage, who had an accident and damaged the frontal lobe. So you have to know your general structures of the lobes, the frontal critical thinking and planning, occipital, think of seeing, right? Um, the parietal, think of all sensation information. And of course, you can't forget the temporal. The temporal is right around your ears, right? Think of tempo, it's what you hear with. So here in the famous case study of Phineas Gage, Phineas Gage had the accident in the frontal lobe. Think of your frontal lobe as your smart parts, your executive functioning, and his got damaged. So before the accident, Phineas was nice. He was responsible. He was kind. After the accident, he wasn't. He was rude. He was irresponsible. He couldn't keep up with his work. You know, he just wasn't his mature self that he used to be. Frontal lobe, got to have it. Got to take care of it. Your brain is divided into two hemispheres, your right hemisphere versus your left hemisphere. And although some people like to say, oh, I'm so left brain, you know, I'm so this, or I'm so right brain, I'm so creative, I'm so this. No, we use both hemispheres all the time. It's like they're an orchestra working together. But you do have to know aspects of the left that are really, you know, exclusive to the left, like language, for example, exclusive to the left. Now, your right does have a role in your language. Your right gives your language which tone and inflection, right? But your left is your language. So without your left, you have no language, right? Your your actual vocabulary will disappear. Um, that's why people who suffer strokes on the left hemisphere, they lose their language. They can make sounds, but they can't make words. Conversely, if they have a stroke on the right hemisphere, they'll have words, but the words will seem monotone and flat. Remember that transmission is also interesting here. They talk about contralateral and ipsilateral transmission. Remember that contralateral means left hemisphere controls the right side of the body. Ipsilateral means the left hemisphere controlling the left side of the body. Most functions are contralateral, right? Opposite sides. Left controlling right, right controlling left. But there are some transmissions that are ipsilateral, like a few eye functions that are left side, left hemisphere. This, of course, is just for fun. So if you don't see this actually happening, please don't worry. But when you're staring at the girl, if she's going clockwise, that's the right hemisphere of your brain picking her up and processing her. If you see her going counterclockwise, that's your left hemisphere picking her up and processing her there. And you might see her switch. And if you don't see her switch, that's OK, too. Have you ever taken a concussion test? This is on there. This is called the Stroop effect. And it's really actually hard to read the words and then read the color off the word without reading the actual word. And when you actually try this and you almost feel like there's a battle, it's really a battle between your right hemisphere versus your left hemisphere. Your right is attracted to the color and wants to scream out the color while your left is of course attracted to the word and wants just say the word. 
Studies have shown that the right hemisphere, when you are watching something sad, is more stimulated than when you're watching something happy, your left hemisphere is more stimulated. So relate that to happy and unhappy, but also related to the immune system. People who are depressed, studies show that they get more sick than people who are not. So that actually has to do with your immunity. One of the functions of the brain is to sense and interpret your, your environment. And this is brought to you by your thalamus. Everything that comes in from the environment goes through the thalamus and gets sent to the cortex to different places depending on what it is. So remember your thalamus is your relay station. Now the reticular activating system is crisscross, bringing everything from the left hemisphere to the right and the right hemisphere to the left. Now the cerebellum is in charge of your balance. So think of writing. Writing takes fine motor coordination. That's brought to you by your cerebellum. Also, cerebellum helps you balance so that you could stand up without falling down or sit in a chair without falling over. Cerebellum balance. Another function of your brain is to manage thoughts and your memories. And you can't talk about thoughts and memories without talking about thinking, which is your frontal lobe, critical thinking, and planning. It's your mature parts. And then you have to also consider the hippocampus. Think of this mnemonic device. If you see a hippo on campus, you'll remember, get it? Without the hippocampus, you can't transfer short-term memories into long-term memories. And hippocampus is a Greek word for um, seahorse, and it looks like a seahorse once it's extracted from the skull. See the little, um, yeah, the picture next to me? Yeah, that's a hippocampus from a brain and a seahorse side to side, right? Identical. I showed in class a video of Clive Wearing. He's probably the most famous amnesiac um, ever. He has the very short capacity in his short-term memory. So by the time you ask him a question and he's beginning to answer it, he's already forgotten the question. So he only has the capacity to hold seconds of information in his short-term memory. Um, and you have to know three different kinds of memory, episodic, semantic, and procedural. Episodic, think of episodes of your life, the person memories of your life. Think of semantic is the memory of words and the understanding of words. And then procedural is any how-to skill, like how to tie your shoe, how to ride a bike. Know your different kinds of memory. In class, we saw some brain game videos about this, but you have to know the different parts of the limbic system. The limbic system is composed of your amygdala, the hippocampus, and your hypothalamus. So think of your amygdala as your fight or flight. It's like your alert center. It gives you a sense of emergency and it kicks things into gear to get you to fight or you know flee. Um, the hippocampus is in charge of your memory. You can't survive really without memory, knowing what could hurt you, um, what you should stay away from. So hippocampus is vital to your survival. And then hypothalamus, you have your drives, like your instinct to sleep, your instinct to eat, your instinct to drink, right? And then you have two parts of the hypothalamus you have to know. You have to know your ventral medial hypothalamus that makes you feel the signal of full, like stop eating. And then your lateral hypothalamus, which gives you the feeling that you need to eat. It's like L for lateral, L for large hunger, right? So it makes you feel hungry so you go out and you eat. In class, we also saw videos of neuroplasticity, the way your brain can refurbish itself and repair itself after injury. In class, we also saw split brain surgery where they severed the corpus callosum. And it's like you have two like independent functioning brains in one skull, very interesting.
so in class, I showed many videos of people that have either gone through a kind of surgery or have had some kind of dysfunction due to some kind of like brain event, anomaly, could be um, like a stroke or an aneurysm. In this part of the module, you're going to learn about how speech production happens, and you can't talk about that without talking about the Brokaw's area and the Wernicke's area. People, for example, who have a stroke in the left hemisphere might suffer from something called Broca's aphasia, which is when you can't produce a word. And so remember that the left hemisphere is exclusive to language. So if you have Broca's aphasia, you might not be able to say a word or find a word that you need to express yourself. I showed several videos in class of people that have different forms of aphasia. And here, um, you're going to see someone who has a stroke in the left hemisphere, and he basically says sounds replace his words, but he's trying to speak to someone, but he's only able to use tone and inflection. The Broca's area is different from the Wernicke's area because the Broca's area is about speech production, how you can speak, but the Wernicke's area is about understanding speech that is being spoken to you. So the fact that you can process what I'm saying to you right now is thanks to your healthy Wernicke's area. Module 1.5 talks about sleep and consciousness, and you have to know the difference. Consciousness means you're aware, unconscious means you're not aware, but guess what? You're still processing the information. And this all goes under the umbrella of cognitive neuroscience. It's a study of brain activity that interacts with our mental processes, and we're always dual processing. Much of the day, we're going throughout the day, and we're consciously processing a lot of it, but a lot of it we're unconsciously processing. Just know the difference. Talking about the sleep cycles is really interesting. Remember that sleep is a periodic natural loss of consciousness. We do it every single night. It's an altered form of consciousness. So you're here one minute and then all of a sudden you're not because you're sleeping. You're in another realm. Um, remember that the circadian rhythm is how our bodies synchronize our 24 hour cycle at each day and night. And depending on your age and depending on experience, it could alter your circadian rhythm. Um, so remember that night and day kind of flow that we're awake during the day and then we're asleep at night circadian rhythm now remember REM means rapid eye movement which means you're dreaming and REM is non rapid eye movement it means quiet sleep you are not dreaming and remember that your sleep cycles are about 90 minutes we go stage one two three four four three two one that's about 90 minutes and then we do it again and again throughout the night here they're talking about the sleep stages. They mention hallucinations, which are sensory experiences that occur without actual environmental stimuli. Um, and it's almost like having hallucination when you're dreaming. You're seeing things that are not there. Um, and these are things that happen during the REM stages. Now, the hypnagogic sen sensations are sensations of falling. It could be a sensation of floating. These are things that are common during the sleep cycle. Another way to reference REM is paradoxical sleep. Paradoxical sleep is REM, and it's because it's a paradox that your mind is really active and your, you know, your brain is super active, but your body, it's a paradox. Your body is quiet and still. Now, REM rebounding is when you are sleep deprived and then your brain takes REM longer and sooner, right from the beginning. If you look at these different EEG images, if you match up your brain while it's sleeping and dreaming during REM, match it up to when you're awake, it's almost identical. So that means that your brain is just as active when you are dreaming in REM as you are when you're walking around awake. 
alpha, beta, theta, delta. That's the order. And then you go right back up again. So remember, it's stage one, two, three, four, and then you go back up four, three, two, one. I think the most important one to know is delta. We don't know a lot about delta sleep. We just know it's called dreamless oblivion. This is the stage where your brain is the slowest throughout the night. But remember that delta is going to decrease throughout the night as opposed to REM. REM increases throughout the night. So the longest, most vivid movie-like dream you'll have is the one right before you wake up. Okay, if you're having trouble sleeping at night, shut the TV off, shut the lights off. The suprachiasmic nucleus, or SCN, is a pair of cell clusters in the hypothalamus that controls the circadian rhythm. And guess what? When the lights are on, it stops this from happening, and it stops sleep. So maybe the answer is create darkness. Darkness produces sleep. So shut the lights off, shut the TV off. Listen, there's a lot of reasons why we love to sleep, and it's because it helps us in so many different ways. Why do we sleep? Sleep protects us, it restores us, it aids our memory, it helps feed creative thinking, it supports our growth, and it helps conserve energy. Sleep deprivation makes us moody, it makes us sad, we'll cry a lot. Um, it'll increase ghrelin, which means we can gain weight, and it'll also increase cortisol, which holds on to fat. So if you're trying to shed those few pounds, try to maybe relax and get a good night's rest. It helps even your dieting. Don't deprive yourself of sleep ever. It has a lot of physiological effects on your body too. So it's gonna increase, for example, blood pressure. It's going to make you irritable. It even can cause cognitive impairment. You need to get a good night's rest every single night, especially before a big test. Know your sleep disorders. Insomnia, you can't sleep. Narcolepsy, you fall asleep uncontrollably. Sleep apnea, you stop breathing. Sleepwalking, you're walking when you're dreaming when you shouldn't be. And remember that REM sleep behavior disorder, it's like what we used to call night terrors. You do this, you act them out, but you don't remember when you wake up. There's various opinions as to why we dream and what the contents of our dream means. That's up for debate, but you have to know the logistics of why we dream and what the biological function of that is and some theoretical proposals about what dreams are about. There are lots of theories as to why we dream, but we definitely know, to sum it all up, that sleeping is very important to your body and your mind, for your mental health. So why we dream and what the contents of our dream means, that's probably up for debate. But know the logistics of dreaming and sleeping and what it does for your body and your mind.